The middle classes like to talk about how hard we're working. It is not the quality of your work that determines your income. We are training human beings to be cogs in a system. That thinking will keep you poor. Get a trade. That way, you will never starve to death. The thinking comes from a place of desperation. And that's the thinking that's handed down generation to generation without perhaps knowing how much damage it can do to future generations. Take a look at the building you see behind me there. That is an Industrial Revolution era factory. What other building that we have today looks very similar to that factory? Out loud, what do you think? Hospitals, what else? S schools, schools, yeah? Schools, and here's an interesting one are run according to the Industrial Revolution age of thinking. Picture this for a second. You drop your kids off at school, or you as a child are dropped off at school, and you line up in neat lines, and the foreman, I mean the teacher, blows the whistle or rings the bell, and in your neat lines you go to your workstation and you sit down. You sit down at your little workstation and you work for a number of hours. And then the foreman, I mean the teacher, blows the whistle, rings the bell, and you take out your little lunchbox and you can have some food. Then the whistle goes again, you go back into your workstation, you sit down. It is run according to an Industrial Revolution era factory. Why? Because we are training human beings to be cogs in a system. And we're still doing it. <laughs> And if you're a perfect cog, you'll get your little bit of money at the end of the day and you can go home. That thinking will keep you poor. So, what are some of the alternatives? Well, that's what I'd like to look at with you here today. I like to call that style of thinking the wheelbarrow way. It basically goes like this. It's like the parents get hold of their child, the young son, the young daughter, and they say, my son, my daughter, you are young and strong. You must go out into the world and earn coins. Here's how you do it. Pick up your wheelbarrow, load it full of bricks, and for every hour that you push your wheelbarrow, you will get one coin. If you want a second coin, you have to push your wheelbarrow for a second hour. Now we think like that. We go, the only way to earn coins is to work for a set number of hours. So let me go and get a job and be dependent on a boss. Now, you work your set number of hours every day. You push your wheelbarrow for your set number of hours and a horrible thing starts to happen. You start to realize that you can't quite afford the car. You're not quite breaking even with the kids and their education and the debit orders and the bonds and so on. So what do you do? You go back to the thinking that was handed down to you. And you say, if I'm not getting enough coins, what do I have to do? I have to push a second wheelbarrow in the evenings to get more coins. That kind of thinking keeps families in generational cycles of poverty. If you take nothing else away from today, this is the one principle that is the most important. Do not tie your earning to the number of hours you work. You've got to separate those two. And I'll show you how today. But so long as we think a number of hours equals a number of coins, we are in financial trouble. Because as a human being, you only have so many hours in the day. The wealthy person's epiphany, the way of breaking out of this idea is this. Dump the bricks in your wheelbarrow. Get rid of them. Load your wheelbarrow up with gold. In other words, for every hour that you push that wheelbarrow, you need to raise the value of your work. Earn more coins per hour, not work more hours in order to get more coins. Today I'd like to share with you eight epiphanies, eight ideas, eight ways of overhauling your thinking that have to do with work and wealth. And my promise to you is that they are going to be uncomfortable. I ain't here to make people feel good, but this stuff is massively important. It's important because we are still being taught the ways to work that are outdated. The world changes, but we're still practicing the old ways. Epiphany number one. Resenting the wealthy says more about us than it does about the wealthy. 
that a wealthy person is not a different species, they're just further along on a continuum. They have more education about what brings in money and how to achieve goals than what you currently have. And that's okay, because that represents hope. That means you can learn these things, you can do them. Number two, there are three things that money is not. The first thing money is not, the root of all evil. The second thing money is not, embarrassing. And if we are embarrassed by money, it changes a number of things. Around the dinner table is a family. We won't talk about it. No, no. The middle classes like to talk about how hard we're working. But we never talk about how to earn money or how to lose money. All of the rules of money. You get into the home of wealthy people and that's what they talk to their children about because they think it's important. Number three, represent yourself. Okay? I highly recommend it. Malcolm Gladwell, Outliers. He talks about the difference between people who fail and succeed in anything. And he talks about how in wealthy families, they teach their children something very different to what is taught in middle class and poorer families. And it's just how to interact with authority. The middle classes and poorer people are taught to fear authority. And it's industrial revolution thinking. You've got to fear the guy who runs the factory because he owns your life. Okay? And it goes like this. Let's take a practical example. They do this one in the book. He says, you're taking your child to the dentist. The middle class family will teach the child that the dentist is God. He has studied for eight years and he knows everything there is to know. You as the child must shut up, sit down, keep quiet, and even if it hurts, don't cry. Just wait for it to be over. Do whatever he tells you to do. Now in wealthy families, they approach the exact same situation completely differently. Driving to the dentist's office, they tell the child, the dentist is your friend. He has studied for eight years so that he can serve you properly. How's that? Okay. The dentist is a resource that you can use. If you have any questions about your mouth, about your teeth, about anything that you want to know there, you must ask the dentist because it's his job to help you. Represent yourself. And we need to teach our children to represent themselves as well. We have been conned into an industrial revolution myth that says authority is in charge and knows best. You must shut up and do what you're told. You must be a cog in a system. And as long as you are doing your job perfectly and not making waves, you'll be fine. That thinking is a hundred years outdated. We cannot teach it any longer. Number five. Number five is an abstract idea. Leaving the ranks of the poor may mean leaving the ranks of the poor. That makes sense? Isn't that a horrifying thought? <laughs> you are likely to be about as wealthy and about as successful as the average of the five people closest to you. What it is saying is we do need to associate with highly successful individuals. Number six, your positioning determines your pay scale. It is not the quality of your work that determines your income. You can be the best in the world at a certain thing and be out-earned by someone who is not the best in the world. Your positioning determines your pay scale. Let's put this in very simple terms. If you're the celebrity of your industry, you're going to out-earn the non-celebrity of your industry, even if that guy's better at it than you. Let's take, for example, anyone here watch the cooking show with Nigella Lawson, seen her on TV? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Nigella Lawson, do you reckon she is one of the top five chefs in the world? No, I don't think so. Do you think she's in the top 100? Mm, I don't think so. Do you reckon she's in the top 1,000? I don't think so. So why is she out earning all of them? Because she's Nigella Lawson. You need to be the icon, the expert, the celebrity, the big name in your industry. Now here's where most people get it wrong. They say knowledge is everything. Knowledge is important, but you also have to bring personality. That's what Nigella Lawson is doing. She is able to speak well in front of a camera. She's pretty. <laughs> She's seductive. Yeah? 
Now this is all the stuff that we are never taught is important. We are taught what's important is be a cog in a system. Don't make waves, function perfectly, get your job done. Imagine if Nigella Lawson did that, she'd be poor. All she'd ever do is cook in a kitchen and maybe earn like five bucks once in a while. Yeah? But because she brings humanity to it, she brings to it things that cannot be done by a computer, that cannot be done by a system. Anything that can be systematized, computerized, commoditized is unvaluable. We're still teaching our kids to study IT. <laughs> That's a low income future. Because there's like two billion other people studying IT. And most of it will be done by the computer itself like tomorrow. That's how fast it's moving. Number seven. This one's more for companies, but it's useful to us as well. Don't fixate on the bottom line. What most companies tend to do is when they think about their finances, they put 80% of their energy into saving what they have and 20% of their energy into earning more. Picture a clan of people. Now I want you to just use your imaginations here. Let's go back thousands of years in time. We're sitting at the outskirts of our cave. We are a clan and we're facing winter. Winter is like recession. Winter is trying. Winter is deadly to us. And our economy is made up of buffalo. We eat them to survive. We wear their coats in order to survive this horrific winter. The hunters have been out into the field and good news, they came back with three buffalo. But three buffalo is not quite enough for our entire clan to make it through the winter. We technically need more. Now the thinking in the clan splits in two. We get the hunters and we get the bean counter in the cave. And the bean counter says, what we have to do is take those three buffalo and conserve them, preserve them, make them last, save them so that we get through the winter. The hunters see it differently. They say, no, no, give us one of the buffalo to eat. And using that strength, we will go back out into the field and we will get more buffalo so that we can make it through the winter. If you don't have enough buffalo. Saving effectively is only going to mean you'll starve to death slower. You need more buffalo in the system. In other words, you need to put 20% of your energy into saving your money and 80% of your energy into generating more money. Number eight, risky is the new safe. The alternative applies, safe is the new risky. We've been taught for generations that to play it safe, you get a job and don't make waves. I contend that that is the most dangerous thing that you can possibly do. Because you are taking all of your eggs and putting them in one basket. You are taking your life, your future, your career, your spouse, your children, your medical aids, your debit orders, your entire life, putting them into one basket and handing them to a person whose first concern is not your welfare. That sounds pretty dangerous to me. For myself as a speaker, I now have multiple income streams. I speak, I train, I sell books, I sell DVDs, I do media appearances, multiple streams of income, much, much safer. Risky is the new safe. Safe is the new risky. And the more we buy into the old industrial revolution era idea that having a boss take care of us is safe, the greater the danger we put our own lives in. Risky is the new safe. Safe is the new risky. In California, the banks and the financiers seek out the people who have tried and failed before because they reckon that person has learned valuable lessons along the way. Give yourself permission to fail. Here's a revolutionary thought. Give other people permission to laugh at you and mock you for trying. Let that be okay. Say, I know my family's not going to understand. I know my friends are going to laugh at me. They're going to tell me this is crazy. You should play it safe and get a job. Give them permission to think that way. Give them permission to laugh at you. Give yourself permission to try and fail. You need the space. You need the leeway. Be kind to yourself. You are not separated from your goals by a number of years. You are separated from your goals by a number of actions. So ladies and gentlemen, don't think poor.